All right, we are so excited um, to come together this evening for the fourth annual Young Gifted and Green Community Action Summit. Um, definitely in a, a very unique and different environment uh, compared to previous summits, but we are just elated to see so many people who are still engaged and still with us um, as we move forward to talk about solutions with truly creating a lead for USA and a better, um, a better and healthy environment. Um, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and move into tonight's program. So just to give you um, a background of what we will be seeing today. So this is like a mini summit. Um, we definitely understand Zoom and screen fatigue um, in the space that we're in. So we actually will have remarks from none other than Congressman McEachin to open up this evening. And then we will have two panels. The first panel will focus on the impact of lead and Superfund sites, as well as the impact with climate and Superfund sites. And then for the second panel, it will be introduced um, by Congresswoman Alma Adams and then the panel will focus on the mommy bus bill for us by us talking about the impact of environmental justice and maternal health so without further ado I am pleased to introduce none other again than congressman McEachin thank you so much and I want to thank all the organizers of this event, and I can't tell you how pleased I am to join you this evening for the fourth annual Young, Gifted, and Green Community Action Summit. You know, the conversation that you all are about to engage in is one that's very personal for me, um, uh, and not just because I made and I've made the environment a priority uh, since I've been in Congress, but because I feel deep, deep down in my soul that it's part of our obligation as, as, as keepers of this wonderful earth that we, this wonderful gift that we call the earth, uh, to, to pass it on in a better, better fashion than the way we found it, to pass it on to your generation and to our children's children's generation uh, so that they can enjoy all the fruits and all the wonders of, of God's creation. After years of this destructive anti-environmental policies, we gotta get it together, y'all. We've got to reverse the Trump years. We've got to demand dramatic climate action, again, to leave the planet better than the way we found it. Far too often, black and brown communities are hit first and worse by the devastating impacts of pollution and climate change because the same racist policies that redlined us into the shadows of pipelines and dirty power plants uh, originated within the same power structures that lent themselves Many many, years, many, many years ago to segregation and Jim Crowism. We've got to combat these injustices. For far too long, the federal government has allowed dirty polluters just to come into our neighborhoods and do what they want to do without regards to the people who live around them. You know, in this COVID age that we find ourselves in, uh, we are busy uh, fighting this pandemic. We're busy trying to um, deal with, as some of my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus call it, the pandemic upon the pandemic, that is the 401 years of racism in this, uh, on this continent. Um, but if we think that all that this moment is about is the COVID-19 uh, virus, if all we think about is tearing down statutes, as, all, as important as those two things are, if all we think about is police reform, as important that, as that is, we would have missed the moment because again, we're talking about 401 years of systematic racism on this continent, and we have got to address what is, in my judgment, the most insidious form of racism of all, environmental injustice. It's insidious because it gets us where we live. It's around us, it's in our air, it's in our water. As I said earlier, we've been redlined to certain parts of town, and that's where all the bad stuff was directed. And then you wonder why we have disparate outcomes in terms of of uh, health outcomes, the disparities and how we react to COVID-19. We wonder why we have higher asthma rates. It's all because of the air we breathe, the water we drink, the environment that we live in. And I'm proud to say that, look, we've been doing the work in Congress and we've uh, been coming up with solutions that we need to have a, a, an, an executive to, to, in a, to enact um, because you cannot solve the climate crisis unless you're prepared 
to put environmental justice at the very center of what you do. You know, I had the privilege to work with Congressman Raul Grijalva, who's the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee in Congress, and together we listened. We did something different in Washington. We stopped and we said, wait a minute. For far too long, environmental justice communities have been dictated to as to how to best to go about solving their problems. And while all these, while all these communities share a commonality in that they've been uh, uh, marginalized, they've been pushed to the side, their individual problems are different. They might confront, confront sea level rise. They might confront bad water like you do in Flint. They might confront bad air. Uh, they, they may have a landfill or coal ash problems. Their problems are different. And so we said to them, you tell us how we can craft legislation that will help you. And we listened for over a year and a half and together he and I acting like Scribner's cobbled together what we were told from the EJ communities that this is what we need. And that has taken the form of the Environmental Justice for All Act. You know, it's easy for folks to say that we wrote the bill, but we didn't because it was written by the people for the people. And I'm happy to report to you that if things go as expected next week, it's gonna hit the floor, at least large elements of the bill will hit the floor of the United States House of Representatives, Representatives next week. And I anticipate that it'll pass. And look, yes, we're gonna have trouble getting it through the Senate, but you know what, we're gonna take this time to do like we're doing tonight and in other parts of uh, the nation, and we're gonna educate folks as to the importance of environmental justice issues. And we're gonna make sure that when 2021 comes, we're ready to rock and roll and fix these problems uh, because the clock is ticking, time is working against us. So look, you're not here to hear me ramble all day about anything, much less environmental justice for all that. You've got a, a great panel that's gonna uh, fill you up with a lot of knowledge and raise a lot of questions and raise, most importantly, a lot of awareness. But I wanna thank you for being young. I wanna thank you for being gifted. God bless you for being black. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being green. Y'all have a great conference. Thank you so much. And what a powerful way to, to end that great introduction. Yes, it is truly a blessing to be young, gifted, and Black and green um, in this space. Um, thank you so much, Congressman McEachin, for um, your inspiring words. It has been such an honor to work with you and your office, um, definitely um, advocating and supporting the Environmental Justice for All Act. It has definitely been an empowering experience working with you. Thank you. So moving forward, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our moderator for the first panel this evening. Um, if we can have Miss Elise Tolbert. And Elise, if you can do a introduction of yourself and then we can move forward with our first panel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Latricia and Black Millennials for Flint for the opportunity to be here and moderate this first panel today. I am Elise Tolbert. I am Deputy Director of Climate Action Campaign and an environmental health scientist and public health practitioner. Um, I have years in the field working in environmental justice and um, have really cultivated that love for the environment and for people from my background being from Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, which is a city that has pioneered in the environmental field in so many ways, starting with George Washington Carver and his work. So I'm excited to be here today and really excited for this dynamic panel that we're bringing to you. I'm excited to bring all of our panelists here for this first panel titled, A Dream Deferred, The Legacy of Toxic Waste in Our Backyards. And for right now, I'd like to bring all of our panelists forward have them introduce our, themselves, and then to get started with this dynamic conversation about Superfund sites and its impact on our health, health and communities. Is Marquita Bradshaw here? Okay, well, we'll get started with our panel. First, I'll have Ms. Um, Inse and Suedo Witherspoon to introduce herself, and uh, then, She'll be followed by Mr. Omega Wilson. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with everyone um, in Seydu, but Witherspoon, but everyone calls me Inse. I'm executive director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, 
which is a national nonprofit that's been working for almost 30 years to work on the protections of all children from environmental hazards. So it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Omega Wilson with the West End Revitalization Association in Mebane, North Carolina. Uh, I work with my wife, co-founder Brenda Wilson, who is uh, uh, nearby. She's been doing some work. And I just also like to thank uh, Michelle Mason of uh, Earth Justice of New York, who invited me to be a part of this panel. I appreciate it. And Alma Adams is my representative, uh, one of our representatives from the state of North Carolina. We'll hear her later. Awesome. And these are two um, terrific professionals and people who have been working with children, working with communities for a long time, who are bringing us such excellent um, content today. So with that, I'd like to get into the first question for the panel. Uh, the first question is, um, in 2019, the U.S. Government Accountability Office reported 60% of the nation's heavily polluted Superfund sites, nearly about 950 of them, are at risk from the impacts of climate change. These include risks from hurricane storms, from storm surge, from flooding, and all of these risks could spread toxic legacies of pollution into the waterways, communities, and to farmlands. In your work, how have you seen lead exposure and climate create lifelong challenges for Superfund sites? Sure, I can jump in. Thank you so much for that very important question. Uh, children are definitely more vulnerable and susceptible to environmental hazards than adults uh, due to a variety of reasons, but their physiology, for example, their respiratory systems, neurological systems, musculoskeletal systems are all still developing um, you know, well after birth which place them in harm's way uh, when they come into contact with any elements and chemicals that were never really meant to enter the human body. And lead is definitely uh, one of those. And also their behavior, putting their hands in their mouth, crawling on the ground is a natural developmental stage uh, that, that they should not be harmed for. But un unfortunately that allows them to pick up little things on the ground like lead paint pieces and chips um, and constantly putting their hands in their mouth is another route of exposure. So all of these factors make children's uh, susceptibilities um, extremely high risk compared to that of adults where we're already developed, right? Um, and I should also point out, young children can be exposed even in their mother's womb, their first environment, um, as well as, you know, of course, in other ways um, after birth. So when we talk about lead contamination at Superfund sites and these legacy sites, they certainly present a threat uh, to the human health and, and the environment overall, and in particular vulnerable populations like children. So over time, lead, which is a naturally occurring element, has been a common environmental contaminant at Superfund sites because for hundreds of years, lead has been mined, smelted, refined, and used in all kinds of products and, and additives like in paint and gasoline, leaded pipe, solder, crystal, ceramics, you know, children's toys, on and on. And so the natural levels of lead in soil can range from you know, small amounts all the way up to 400 parts per billion, which is a lot. Um, as a result of these legacy type of industries um, over the years, these communities have been overwhelmed and overburdened with the, this type of exposure. I have personally seen lead exposure from Superfund sites and communities um, for the two decades of work that I've been working um, in this field of work. Um, there, are already high, there are already high risk situations, you know, where these communities are already, again, overwhelmed with a variety of environmental uh, contaminants, not just lead. But as the climate continues to change, and we're all seeing the implications of that you know, climate changing right before us, no matter where we are in the country tonight, we're seeing uh, those realities. Um, and the type of 100-year storms we're having that's becoming the norm, uh, very active, uh, overactive, I would say, hurricane seasons that bring large amounts of wind and rain um, and moisture into communities over and over again. And the routes of exposures just continue to increase. So when you have already frontline communities in harm's way on a regular day, when you start shaking up that system and moving things around and uplifting soil um, and really, you know, further contaminating, you know, these industries that then are over, you know, pouring into the waterways and that type of thing, it's just a recipe for disaster. There's also a huge equity issue here because we know that lower income indigenous black and Latin Latinx communities have and will continue to have and fare the worst in these situations. And that certainly is not okay. Uh, especially when vulnerable children in particular in these communities are in direct harm's way. And what really gets me on my soapbox is that lead poisoning is irreversible. 
It's not a death sentence. Uh, many of us know families dealing with lead poisoning um, and in their children, but it certainly is preventable. There's enough, as we all know in this uh, life, <laughs> that is challenging enough, but to then have a preventable uh, exposure like lead, um, but just because of your zip code or where uh, the, the mom or dad worked or other exposures in the learning school environment or child care, it's just something that we cannot stand for. Definitely, and Mr. Wilson, would you like to take a stab at that question as well? Right. Uh, I would like to take a, a different uh, direction, specifically related to the Superfund, uh, because we have some particular issues here in our community that are representative of, of communities throughout the South and other parts of the country, but particularly in North Carolina and the South, in the Southeastern part of the country. Uh, there are some Superfund sites that are, have, have not been designated Superfund sites, and those are some of the most dangerous ones. And in our particular community, we had to file a complaint against EPA, uh, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, uh, which is our state environmental protection agency in 2014, and the North Carolina Department of Transportation for planning an interstate highway coming through our community just a quarter of a mile from where I'm sitting, through a 30-acre legacy uh, factory, uh, an abandoned or closed furniture plant that was built in the 1800s. And it was built in this black community, most of the labor, the hand labor, exposed labor were African-American men who were handling the chemicals that are used to dye and stain high-end furniture the oaks, the walnuts, et cetera, which is carcinogenic. Uh, decades later, we filed complaints to try to get the highway to go around this site. And we got the department, the State Department to do some research. We dove through some files. And what we found is that they had already done some research and drilled 40 some wells, test wells, down to five stories in the ground where they were finding these chemicals that had been dumped on the ground for decades, long before EPA was established. We're talking about a hundred year old site. These are legacy sites. And that, that chemical combination included cancer causing benzene, chemicals, uh, cancer causing xylenes, and other chemicals. Uh, this is an interesting combination of chemicals that also are used to keep insects off of uh, high class front wood to keep them from boring holes in it. That we know it now is mothballs. It's the chemical composition in mothballs, which is highly uh, toxic. Uh, it can be deadly to children. In the old days, when I was growing up, I'm 70 years old, it was a, a very interesting thing where children sometimes would try to eat these little salt looking balls that look like candy. It had a very powerful fragrance. All of these kind of chemicals were found on the ground, found on in the, the ground, ground, in the ground, and in, 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 in the ground. ground. In, in, in the ground. So what we're looking so at, is, what we're looking at, I'm, get, I'm getting a feedback from somebody, right? What, what we're looking at is a situation where we are not we're missing a lot of this. We're missing a lot of these legacy issues because uh, Superfund site, sites are not designated Superfund sites like the one right next door to where we're living because the state, the federal government would have to stop a billion dollar highway corridor coming through our community 27 miles to Danville, Virginia. So a lot of these con massive construction projects that are fostered and funded with our tax money at the county level, city level, and state level are overlooked in order to build things in our community to destroy our community. In our case for filing our complaints, we were filing our complaints starting in 1999, 1999, 21 years ago, because houses in this community were going to be destroyed, churches within in this community was going to be destroyed, uh, cemeteries were going to be uh, dug up 
that dated back into slavery where slaves were buried up until this day. Their families and descendants were buried up until this day. And these residents never had been tapped on the safe drinking water and sewer services, even though they were two blocks from the sewage treatment plant that was built in 1921, a hundred years ago. So we're tying, there's an interrelationship with where you find lead, you find other kinds of contamination. Where you find low community, you find Superfund sites that have not been designated by the federal government or EPA. So one of the things we encourage people is to look at uh, brownfield sites, look at abandoned mills, because very often those sites will have some of the greatest amount of contamination in black and brown communities and indigenous areas throughout the South and other places in the country. So I'm, I'm adding that to talk about a real life experience that we're talking about right here today. And they're building brand new, new facilities right beside the old facilities, bringing what they call proprietary chemicals. And I hope everybody knows what that means. It means even the federal government allow these new factories to be built without having to tell them or first responders what chemicals they're using to manufacture whatever they're manufacturing. Proprietary means they keep it a secret from everybody, the police, the fire, the rescue, the medical workers, the state government, and the federal government, which is a crime in itself. You raise a really um, important point that segues us into our second question very well. Um, before we go to our second question, I'd like to invite our um, additional par participants and panelists to introduce themselves briefly um, before we jump into the second question. So I'd like uh, Mr. Frank Johnson to introduce himself and Ms. Marquita Bradshaw. We'll start with Ms. Marquita Bradshaw. Sorry, Ms. Bradshaw, Hi. we can't hear you. Okay. Okay, there you go. Hi, my name is Marquita Bradshaw. I grew up in South Memphis. Um, uh, Frank and I grew up in the same neighborhood, which we had a military landfill, which was across the street from our elementary school. There were about 17 schools in that area, and it was a working class community. And so um, the one thing about living um, next to a national priority list super fun site is that these chemicals were made to kill people and made to kill plant plants. And um, I've been working on environmental justice issues for 25 years. My mom started an organization called Defense Depot, Memphis, Tennessee Concerned Citizens Committee. And my sisters and I and their friends, we started Youth Terminating Pollution as youth organizers. Thank you, Ms. Bradshaw. Mr. Johnson. Please introduce yourself. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, like Marquita said, uh, I'm Frank Johnson. Uh, I grew up probably uh, maybe about two blocks from Marquita. I've actually known Marquita since I was in third grade. Um, and like Marquita said, you know, um, living next to these super fun sites, it's like it's like life as usual. And you think that these sicknesses and these illnesses are just part of the family. And it has hit my family, like Marquita's, in so many ways. And it's actually hit us too personally. And then to just kind of go back and realize like the illnesses that your family has been experiencing is not necessarily anything that you all did wrong, but it's directly connected to the community that you came out of. And so that's my work, former teacher. Uh, I got into this work because of Marquita and her mother. And like, I'm just here to listen and just to learn. Well, thank you. And we're going to transition into our second question now. So our second question is um, really, really uh, is a really great spinoff from our first question. And the second question is, many Superfund sites across the country have not been fully resolved for decades, causing generations of environmental hazard induced illnesses and a significant body burden. Body burden, as you all likely know, is the total amount of a particular chemical or environmental toxin that is present in a human's body. 
Some substances build up in the body because they are stored in fat or bone or because they leave the body very slowly. Heavy metals like lead are a major contributor to body burden. How do we hold local account, local, official, local state and federal government officials accountable for this issue of body, bur body burden and even of cumulative exposure? Thanks, this is Ense again. Um, I've got some ideas. Uh, a lot of this is related to the elected leadership, right? We need to elect leaders that actually do not discredit or attack science, actually listen to their communities and involve communities within these major decisions and you know, without just displacing and self-imposing um, very uninformed decision-making which have you know, decades long impact in these communities. And that actually stands behind the urgency of not having any communities on you know, a fence line in the first place um, and in direct harm's way. We need to be ensuring that the EPA is actually able to do their job. Remember, there's the national federal EPA. There are also regional EPA offices um, and some local, right? And right now during this current administration, uh, they have been totally unable to do what they are mandated to do, which is be a regulator of the chemicals that are you know, in our air and our water and supposed to be uplifting public health provisions. Uh, the total opposite of that is happening. I'm spending a good amount of my time on a weekly basis defending and trying to uh, ward off these constant attacks on our air, our water, our, our basic public health provisions. We need to not back down, right? We need to use the science, the, the data that's available, these many case examples across the country, sadly, um, and lift them up and leverage them uh, in any way, shape, and form possible and expose for what it is, the deep systemic racism that plays such a huge part here. It's a whole part of the cyclical process. It's not been enough uh, for these programs over the years to kind of nibble at the edges um, and barely get done, you know, half of what they're mandated to get done. As Omega just said, we also have um, non-officially uh, identified Superfund sites, right? So the ones that are there and have been identified for years still are not cleaned up. And then we've got ones that still have to be designated and cleaned up. And every um, excuse in the book is provided for why that is not happening. But we all know if these sites were in other neighborhoods uh, or, or with, where folks you know, had different means and different social economic levels, things would be a lot more expeditious or not even an issue at all. Um, and we also need to be thinking about, I, I would offer, we need to be thinking through and taking advantage of the lens of, of children as a unifier, no matter what your political persuasion, most people, logical thinking people want the next generation to be better off than them. Now, I say that knowing that it's not as easy as it sounds or else my entire mission and organization wouldn't still be needed in 2020, almost 30 years of existence. But um, what I have seen is that um, even with the most critical uh, you know, types of folks that just are not understanding or willing to understand what communities are going through, when you start talking and bringing in the next generation into the picture, it becomes much more challenging to just pretend like you haven't heard uh, what the community is saying. Um, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences has a Superfund basic research program. It also is supposed to have an um, edu uh, educational community um, aspect uh, to that. There's a variety of different you know, research, uh, peer-reviewed research that has come out of this program year after year after year. Uh, it's available for all of us. Again, I know that research is not only it, but if we can con continue leaning on that available existing database that's supposed to be there for all of us, um, and I would say even if needed, it's legal action, right? That's also becoming a very popular, has been, but it's totally uh, uh, upped its ante, especially during this administration, that it's not okay to just be sitting by and letting communities day after day, week after week, be constantly exposed knowingly uh, when prevention um, is, is necessary to warding off the exposure and the short and long-term illness that no doubt will come. So there's just some initial ideas that I've been thinking about. Thank you, and I think that's so important, especially as we talk about accountability, because we have to understand and be able to use these levers of accountability for, for protecting our communities, protecting our health, and protecting children, and figuring out what messages are um, the messages that resonated mo resonate most as well, uh, messages that are, of course, grounded in the science. Um, and our, our next question really kind of gets to a topic that I think is uh, a topic that people are thinking about a lot because we're seeing it in our cities all over the country so much. That topic is gentrification. So as we look at Superfund sites and the interchange between Superfund sites and gentrification, we see that they have a close kinship to them. 
Uh, the U.S. smelting and lead refinery is commonly known as USS Lead is a Superfund site that's located in East Chicago, which is located in Northwest Indiana. The site includes part of the former USS Lead facility along with the nearby commercial, municipal, and residential areas. The EPA estimates the cleanup of the site would cost approximately $28 million and would take seven months to complete, making the site new, um, suitable for new housing development. But, you know, with new housing development comes the question of what about the families? What about all of the small businesses and the people who have made this area home for themselves for gentrification despite the um, legacy of environmental pollution? Um, with that in mind, what does justice look like for the families and for the individuals who are impacted in areas like this as there's redevelopment of long-term Superfund sites? Marquita, if you're answering, we can't hear you, I'm sorry. With one thing um, is to note is that we have a framework work to work from to actually describe what environmental justice is. And that is based on the work that Hazel Johnson from Chicago actually did years ago with many other mothers in the environmental justice movement across the nation. And that's the executive order, let's see, make sure I say it right, 12898. Um, and it's to address environmental justice in minority populations and low-income populations. And so what you described is, um, first of all, there's no such thing as, as cleanup. Um, you cannot move dirt around and put clean dirt on top of dirty uh, stuff and think uh, that's going to be clean. You know, and that's the reason why I encourage you to use the word remediation. Um, they are remediating the, uh, the levels to be close to residential levels, uh, which means that if there's high traffic or anything like that where the ground can be disturbed, that it possibly can mean that that community can be re-exposed again. Um, and so we are working from a framework that environmental justice is creating healthy and safe communities where people live, learn, work, worship, and recreate through policy. And so people have to participate in policy in order to see that in their neighborhoods. What you just described is something that happens all the time, is that you get, um, even by the Defense Depot, there are brand new houses that are being built um, for uh, low-income hood homes um, to bring people into the middle class. But when you are in a community where your health can be impacted again, and you're probably coming from a community that's from pollution, um, then, you know, your health and the environment is closely tied together. Uh, environmental induced diseases go undiagnosed. And so the communities that are getting gentrified, um, some people are able to stay there, but the new people that come along, because they may be more uh, affluent and more connected to the political system, they will be the squeaky wheel to try to find a solution. Um, where they, well, they'll be heard, whereas when it comes to black, brown, indigenous, and poor white communities, even though the data is there because people are sick and dying, and they know they are, um, and, this, and that's the data that they should be looking at, um, and they don't because it's convenient not to because of how disparities happen within low-income, black, brown, indigenous, and poor white communities. And I would like to just follow in behind uh, Marquita. We have an example here in Memphis. Uh, my family is actually connected to both of these communities. Um, the community that was formerly known as Good Homes, which was a housing project. Most people, because it's been allowed to kind of cycle out of the, the common memory of everybody, is that Foot Homes was a, a, a bayou at one time. And it was filled in with toxic waste uh, in the 1940s. And they built Foot Homes on top of it. Uh, my family was, my daddy's family, they were some of the first people moved, for, forcibly moved into foot homes. And my daddy remembered that it was a, a toxic site. So his point when he got out the army was to move his family from that site into uh, what he thought was a safe community. Ended up, ended up moving the family 
one contaminated neighborhood into another one by the defense depot. We now know that my oldest sister, who has been basically rendered disabled uh, from brain cancer, uh, we know now that she was lead poisoned in foot homes and then was moved into this community and developed a rare brain cancer, the same as my mom's uh, almost 15 years before her. And the thing is, is now at that foot home site, they're putting new apartments there. And the thing, they were having meetings last year and I purposely went to the meeting because I wanted to hear what they were going to say about the history of that site. And throughout this meeting, the only thing you heard was how pretty it was going to be, how they were going to have art on the walls and it was going to be within walking distance of downtown. And so I just politely raised my hand and asked the nice question, what are you all doing about the contamination issue that has been at this site? And I know that there has been one because I ended up teaching at the elementary school right up the street while this was happening. And so again, I'm seeing these children coming in with the same behaviors that me and Marquita saw in our friends growing up, the same eczema, the same asthma, the same things. And then I read this about foot homes. And so I just wanted to see what she was going to say. And I, she, she began to stutter. She didn't know how to handle my question because she was not expecting anybody to come in and ask that question. But when I asked it, she had to admit, she had to admit that there was a history of contamination at that site. She couldn't deny it. She could not deny it. But what really struck me was this whole effort to erase the histories of these communities. Like they're trying to come in now where me and Marquita were raised. And it's just a complete, we're just, going, we're just not gonna even talk about it. And then when you do talk about it, that's when they want to come ask you questions and things like that. But it's a common history. And I think that that is a point now. Uh, back to the earlier question about what can we do? We have to be purposeful in telling people the histories of these communities. And not only just people outside of the communities, but the people that are inside. Because we have decades of people that have no idea. I had no idea until about six years ago when I met up with Marquita and her mother. And uh, Marquita and Ms. Doris told me that that cancer was connected directly to the Defense Depot. And we have to be vocal, and I mean as much as we possibly can, to remember, to make sure that these histories and these leg legacies of Black suffering are not forgotten. That's very powerful and, um, and, and really hard to hear at the same time. And what we have heard and is kind of a common theme is that there are communities with legacies of pollution. And what we've seen over the past, over this year, is that um, these legacies of pollution have made communities already um, vulnerable, even more vulnerable to public health threats, such as the public health threat that's been caused by COVID-19. Um, and with that, my, my question for you is, um, you know, at the legislative level, the U.S. Congress has worked to pass the CARES and the HEROES Act, but has failed to include COVID-19 hazardous and medical waste oversight in these bills or in any other environmental justice bills. The medical waste can contain active forms of the environment and such waste is being dumped in communities already disproportionately impacted by the virus. Oh, Megan Wilson, could you talk to us about how we can hold decision makers accountable to this issue and continue to advocate to enact federal laws and public health statutes for managing COVID-19 hazardous waste where Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people are already disproportionately impacted and are disproportionately contracted, contracting the virus? Could you just kind of frame that, that frame that issue for us? Tell I thank you. I appreciate the question because I, I I wrote the question. <laughs> I'll, I'll take ownership of the question. Um, the question is related to uh, a report that our organization in Mebane, the West Indian Revitalization Association, uh, has been working on for several months. We were we are part of a national environmental justice forum with major environmental justice leaders from all over the country in association with WEAC out of New York, Peggy Shepherd's a group. I think probably most of the people on this uh, uh, virtual meeting will, will know who they are and what they've been doing, one of the oldest environmental justice organizations in the country. So they asked some questions, some of the issues that we wanted to raise, our organization wanted to raise back here several months ago. 
a, a lot of people didn't expect the response and didn't necessarily recognize the information or maybe thought maybe they, it wasn't quite correct. So we wrote a full 18 page report related to COVID-19 pandemic hazardous and medical waste to let people know that right now there's no congressional guidelines or rules related to it. And it goes right back to this conversation and this great panel and this whole idea of having this panel because where does a lot of the waste go? A lot of the waste goes in black and brown and indigenous communities. Who are the people who handle it for little or no money? Black and brown, low income white residents. Who are the people who are less likely to have insurance coverage? And very often these workers who are exposed and handle the waste are maybe getting an hourly wage, uh, but do not have health insurance. It's kind of, people say, well, how can that be? There's a group on strike right now who handle this kind of waste in New Orleans, uh, African-American men who are on strike, who are hazardous and garbage workers who are uh, getting $10 and 15 cents an hour and have no health insurance. Uh, there are people in their own strike. There are people who've been on strike at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill because they didn't have enough PPEs. They didn't have enough protective gears. They were the house cleaners, quote unquote. They call house cleaners, maids, um, John and Terrell maintenance staff. They have different names for it. And they'd already sued Carolina when my aunt and uh, cousin worked there several years ago because of their exposure and health risks and people getting ill, not from COVID-19, but other kinds of waste that came out of fraternities, frat houses, parties, cleaning up labs, cleaning up hospital halls, et cetera. So this particular document is asking the United States Congress and the House of Representatives, our, our blue and red and gray colleagues, that this is not this is a bipartisan issue that everybody should be behind to actually create for the first time ever legislation in the United States government to track and manage and have oversight and regulation rel relative to this waste. The waste is medical waste, which comes out of the human body. The medical waste is pharmaceutical waste, which comes through the human body and off the uh, doctors and nurses. The medical waste is sewage that goes down a sewage treatment plant. The medical waste and testing waste comes from the labs. The biggest lab that's doing the testing in the United States is LabCorp, $10 billion corporation that was founded right here in Alamance County, where I'm sitting. We've been pushing the issue for several months. We've had some of our documents read into the United States House of uh, Representatives Subcommittee on on uh, energy and commerce. The report that we've written has been written about, and there's a link that I just put on that links to an article that was written about uh, our work uh, uh, from the E&E &E News uh, online that interviewed several scientists, EPA officials, retired and still working, that validated what we're talking about, that there are virtually no laws. Our communication with uh, Representative McEachins and Representative Raul Rehover's staff, as well as Senator Booker's staff and Senator Bernie Sanders' staff, referred to this issue as the wild, wild west, because there's never been anything done about it. Why? The reason is because the biggest exposure for hazardous and medical waste and where it's disposed of, black and brown communities, indigenous communities, the least of the least of, not third class citizens, fourth class citizens. And for that reason, Congress has never done anything about it. So we're pushing now through the Citizen Science Association National, through the Environmental Law and Policy Center at Duke University, through the American Public Health Association, and through the environmental, uh, uh, the environmental justice sections of various organizations and environmental justice forums. And we have several documents and reports that we're in the process 
are releasing and have been releasing and sharing with people over the last several months. Well, thank you for informing us of that. And it's really critical that we think about the fact that, that we have an influx. We hear that hospitals are overwhelmed. There's an influx of patients. And with an influx of patients and treating people, there's an influx of medical waste. Um, and someone also has to handle that. So as we think about environmental justice is where we live, work, and play, also considering um, the impacts of um, these exposures on workers as well and what justice looks like for workers is also extraordinarily important in this conversation about having healthy places to live, healthy places to work, healthy places to play, healthy places to worship. And so what I want to do now is just thank you. Thank all of you all for the insight that you all have brought today to this panel. I think that our audience has been enriched by the, um, by the content that you all have brought. And what I want the audience to know is that you all are looking at fighters. You all are looking at superheroes without capes who do this work every day in and out. And I'm um, just honored to be here with you all. I thank you all for this panel and uh, for your participation today. Thank you. Recognize President Latricia Adams and Ambassador Vanessa Vassell for centering Black maternal health and environmental justice in their research, advocacy, and community engagement. Tonight's session, For Us, By Us, Prioritizing Black Maternal Health and Policy, will highlight the importance of the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act and other policies that prioritize reducing preventable morbidity and mortality among Black mothers. This conversation is incredibly important and timely as our nation continues to grapple with the pervasive systemic racism, including in our environmental, energy, and healthcare systems. As we all know, low-income Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities are disproportionately hurt by negative environmental impacts. And environmental injustice, systemic racism also directly affect one of the biggest public health crises of our time, Black maternal health. In the US, the rate of maternal mortality is now worse than it was 25 years ago. For Black women, the risk of death from pregnancy-related causes is a staggering three to four times higher than for white women. These health disparities that Black mothers and infants face are further exacerbated by environmental racism. For example, Black communities are disproportionately exposed to air pollution, which studies show can increase the risk of premature birth and low birth weight. The maternal health crisis and all its causes must be addressed. And that's why last April, Congresswoman Underwood and I launched the Black Maternal Health Caucus. And it's why earlier this year, our caucus unveiled a comprehensive legislative package to address these issues. The Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2020 is a package of nine bills that build upon existing legislation to comprehensively address the maternal health crisis. Our legislation would 
train providers to screen for social determinants of health, including environmental risks. And to help address those risks, it commissions a study on the impacts of climate change and pollution on maternal and infant health outcomes. The Momnibus provides a roadmap to ensure our healthcare system, lawmakers, and society prioritize black and brown maternal health. Because black mothers have the right to spend their pregnancy in safe, stable, affordable, and adequate housing and have access to affordable, nutritious foods. Black mothers and their doulas have the right to be listened to and treated with dignity and respect during the sacred event of childbirth, whether at home, in a birthing center, or in a hospital. Black mothers have the right to be cared for by providers free of bias, racism, and discrimination. No Black woman should die due to neglect, dismissal, or mistreatment. Black mothers have the right to welcome and raise their baby into a home that's free of lead-contaminated water. Black mothers have the right to raise their children in communities free of air pollution and contaminated soil and exposure to extreme temperatures. But unfortunately for many Black mothers and communities across this great nation, birth justice, environmental justice, and racial justice have not been served. So the Black Maternal Health Caucus will keep fighting, and thankfully we are not alone in this fight. The work of such community-based partners as Ancient Song Doula Services, Mama Toto Village, Mama Mom Cares, the National Association to Advance Black Birth, Black Millennial, Millennials for Flint, and the Black Mamas Matter Alliance is truly moving the needle toward improved outcomes for Black mothers, infants, and families. And conversations such as tonight's panel are critical in at, at advocating for Black mothers, increasing awareness, and developing solutions that are for us, by us. Congratulations on the fourth annual Young, Gifted, and Green Summit, and keep up the good work. Good evening and thank you all for sticking around for our second panel. Uh, we are getting ready to get started on For Us By Us, prioritizing Black maternal health in health policy. And so I am so grateful, first of all, for Congresswoman Adams' remarks and her shout outs to all of our partner organizations. And um, without further ado, if you are on this panel, I would love for you to get your camera started and um, whoever is ready to introduce yourself, um, I'd love for our panelists to get started um, sharing with our listeners who you are, what you do, and what you have coming up. So we can start with Tenille. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tenille Bailey. And currently, I serve as a secretary for the National Association to Advance Black Birth, NAB for short. Um, I'm also the maternal health coordinator with Baltimore Healthy Start, and we are also a Safer Childbirth Cities grantee. Um, and I also sit on several, um, several boards as a member, one of them being the Reproductive Health Equity Alliance of Maryland. Uh, the Blossom Doulas Collective here in Maryland, and uh, recently began working with the National Birth Equity Collaborative. So I'm very happy to be here this evening and to talk about all things Black maternal health. Thank you so much. And Katrina, would you like to go next? Good evening, everyone. First off, thank you to Black Millennials for Flint for doing such an amazing job. Um, the work that you all do is really um, impeccable. 
Um, again, my name is Katrina Tillman. I am the CEO of Revive Community Health Center here in the city of Flint, um, where we are focusing on the health disparities within um, the African American community, maternal and infant health disparities, as well as um, behavioral services for our children here in the Flint community. I am also a First Lady of First Trinity Missionary Baptist Church, one of the uh, key partners here in the city of Flint with Black Millennials for Flint. And I am just so excited um, to have this conversation and to um, share information with the audience. Thank you, Katrina. And Katrina is also one of our lead prevention ambassadors, one of our outgoing uh, lead prevention ambassadors in my cohort, 2019-2020. Um, and last but not least, Ms. Sonia. Hello, I am so um, really excited just to be here with all of you. I have to really acknowledge that, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, our lives have changed significantly. Um, and sometimes you try to see, you know, where there is a bright light or, you know, some, you know, something different that you can say is good as a result. And, you know, the fact that we're, a, you know, co a collection of, you know, folks here, um, you know, in this session, you know, from across the nation, um, you know, is really a testament to how, you know, we are able to come together through this new technology. Um, and then get connected and get to know one another. There is such tremendous work going on around um, the state and in California, but around the nation. And I'm just excited to hear about it from, you know, the sisters that are here and, you know, just of course hearing from, you know, the Congresswoman. I mean, I'm, we're, we're, we're greatly um, excited about the opportunities. So I'm Sonia Young Adam. I'm the CEO of the California Black Women's Health Project and we are a statewide, organization committed to health and wellness of black women and girls, 1.2 million of us in the state of California. And a body of our work is centered around, you know, maternal and infant health. Um, we take a health in all approach, but we are, you know, most certainly, um, you know, working in, in two directions. One is to, you know, build uh, advocacy capacity in the community and to build knowledge and awareness and internal community initiatives to support you know, better birth for our sisters. And the other is a vertical advocacy approach, which is the policy advocacy piece where we are, you know, working with partners around the state of California to, you know, uplift legislation, you know, that respects, um, you know, the spaces that we're in and that, you know, calls on the public health and the private healthcare system uh, to do better, uh, much better, um, you, you know, to the point of, you know, where, you know, our, our very lives are, um, you know, dependent on, change you know in this in this work so i'm happy to be here thank you for letting me introduce myself thank you for inviting me um, and i'm looking forward to this conversation thank you so much and you all know i always like to have somebody from the west coast on our panel being that i'm from seattle so i'm always so happy to have some west coast representation um, so our first question is uh, about um, the legislation that Congresswoman Adams mentioned in her film. Uh, the Black Maternal Health Caucus introduced the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2020 to end preventable severe maternal morbidity and preventable maternal mortality in the United States and to close disparities in maternal health outcomes. The CDC reports, as it was mentioned in the clip, that Black women are three to four times more likely to die due to childbirth-related causes than white women. And as we know, this statistic is much more grave in some cities and states than others. What's really unique about the Momnibus is its focus on multiple social determinants of health across a woman's life course and um, which of those social determinants of health make the greatest impact on her health. So my first question panel is, in your work, how can health policy be most effective at addressing social determinants? And how can health policy be effective in promoting environmental justice, birth justice, and reproductive justice, especially among those who do not recognize that inequities, injustice, and racism exist? Big, heavy question. <laughs> you know, I, I'll say here in, in being in Flint, there are so many different 
I mean, in, in most, it's not just a, a, a Flint issue, but in, in most um, cities across the country, especially in those black and brown communities, there are so many different layers to um, health disparities. Um, you know, here in Flint, you know, it's, it's one of the things that for a woman, if she is pregnant and the water is tainted, and the water has lead in it and um that that child that she is carrying now has lead within this system and then it becomes a generational thing um within the body within um generations to come so i think moving forward it's it's amazing and it's it's great that we have um those sisters that that are out there on the front line um, on the legislative side um, making sure that um, our voices are being heard and that our concerns are being addressed um, as it relates to the health disparities within our communities and making sure that there's actual laws that um, that can help us address these issues. You know, right now we live in a day where you have a lot of men, um, especially Caucasian men, making decisions for the woman's body. Um, and so I applaud those who are um, standing on the front line and putting um, their necks out on the line. And it's unfortunate that we have to even address it in that way when you're talking about a woman who um, is carrying child. You know, we are the givers of life. Um, but I applaud those who are um, making sure that there is legislation being, being made to address these issues to help those of us on a grassroots level to put them in effect. There is a uh, film that came out in, uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, in 2004 called The Kite Runner. And the film is set, or initially is set in Afghanistan in 1978. And there is a line in the film that struck me so deeply. And one of the leading characters tells a young boy whose mother um, died in childbirth that it's a dangerous thing to be born. Dangerous for the mother, dangerous for the child. This is 1978 in Afghanistan. And the fact that today, right here in the United States of America, much can be said that is the same. It can be a for a black woman, a black birthing person, it can be dangerous to be born, dangerous for the mother, dangerous for the child. That is, is, is devastating. And it's even more devastating that we've got, you know, 30 and 40 years of work that communities have been doing to address this issue. But as you fast forward, only in recent years, in the last couple of years, will, you know, I say that we began to recognize that there is legislation that there are policies that are being addressed on the national issue and for us in California at the state as well as at our regional county levels. And so to hear the Congresswoman talk about this roadmap, I mean, this, this is, you know, like a, a, a collection of, you know, um, bills, you know, that cover an entire scope of, of things to address our health. And it's so critical. But it's extremely helpful that there, there are policies that are happening across the country. And I'm so proud that in California, we have our perinatal equity initiative that was passed in 2018, um, thanks to